Welcome to the Tipsy Knits podcast. This is one of our Another Round series of pre-recorded content for our summer 2019 hiatus. We hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome back. Today, the lovely Sia and I are speaking to Kirsty of Grunek Creations. Yep. So, Kirsty, who are you? <laughs> Hi, I am Kirsty of Grunek Creations, as Pip has said. Um, I'm a knitter, crafter, yarn dyer, project bag sewer, um, pretty much dabble in every craft possible. Mm -hmm. And where can people find you and your lovely podcast where they to Google you? Okay, so first you can find me on Facebook as Grenade Creations. Um, Shall I spell that? Because some people get a wee bit confused. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Grunek, even though it sounds like there's a K on the end, there isn't actually. So it's G-R-I-A-N-A-I-G. And that's actually um, Gaelic for Grunek, which is where I am born and bred. So it's pronounced Grunek. Mm -hmm. And so it's Grunek Creations on Facebook and Grunek underscore creations on Instagram mm -hmm. and then you can just search on Etsy for Grenade Creations as well mm -hmm. and then lastly I have the Grenade Creations podcast on YouTube. Yes, excellent. So search for that and it should pop up. Yes, that's a good thing about having quite a unique username mm -hmm. slash oh. shop name. Definitely helps on that front, but also having one that people can't pronounce or spell, not so good. Mm. <laughs> well, we'll make sure we put a link yeah. in the notes as well, so people can just click into our blog post and go straight through to all of your different places. Thank you. That makes it a bit easier. <laughs> we aim to please. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of tipsy knits, doesn't have to be alcoholic, but do you have a tipple of choice when you're knitting or crafting? I guess it depends on the time of day. If it's in the morning, I tend to have uh, just your bog standard breakfast brew. Mm -hmm. um, because if I don't, I get like a severe caffeine headache. And I just feel like, you know, there's a part of me that's just not quite switched on. Um, and then uh, throughout the day, it could be anywhere from like Iron Brew, Fanta, Tango, that kind of thing, just a soft drink. And then at night time, it tends to just be um, like diluting juice because I have severe caffeine addiction and sensitivity at the same time. Oh, so I have to okay. like, cut off the caffeine by like 4 p.m. Otherwise, I will never, ever, ever sleep. Yeah. Ouch. Mm. But no, I like a good breakfast brew. Um and just, I'm t I tend to like mostly stick to soft drinks. Cool. I like soft drinks. Yes, yeah, soft drinks are good. Sometimes we drink less. Yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but less. I drink alcoholic drinks as well, but I'm nothing like the tipsy knitters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, less about us. How do we, how, well, kind of about us actually. How do we know you? Or how do you know us? That's probably a better way of saying it. Or is that? <laughs> How do we know each other? Uh, we guys met for the very first time at Perth, the second Perth Festival Yarn. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of on a whim because I was actually vending. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and I seen like where the podcasters were all meeting up. I looked up and I seen that people were starting to like flock to that area. Mm -hmm. and thankfully I had my mum helping me on the stall and I just said to her like I'll be back I think I gave her like a really unrealistic time frame I was like yeah I'll be, I'll be five minutes nope um <laughs> and it was kind of like that really awkward like first meet moment where you're just like because you you two knew each other I knew nobody mm -hmm. so I just kind of was like hi <laughs> um and pretty much the rest is history like you guys were so welcoming and nice and then there was like Rosie and Helen as well and I think we were all just kind of that anxious nervous moment where 
I think you could have probably been like the worst people in the world but at that point you were just like you were too anxious to kind of tell mm-hmm. but it turns out like you're pretty awesome so oh thank you <laughs> flattery will get you everywhere I know I've learned that in life it's pretty good <laughs> I think you have a selfie of us all yeah I, think it was you I, did. I, I still have that picture somewhere and I know it's on my Facebook no my Instagram I know it's definitely on there um I'm not sure if I put it in my podcast for Perth or not. I think you might have. I'm not sure. I can, I can always dig out the archive and repost that that bad boy. Yeah. But, no, it, it was a good day, and mm-hmm. if it hadn't been for Perth, I don't like. Even though you guys are Glasgow and I'm down the coast, I don't know if we'd have met if Perth hadn't been that starting point. Yeah, I don't yeah, think I'm I, not sure. I don't think we would have to be honest. Um Yeah. And I wouldn't have got to squish all your beautiful yarn mm. and buy your beautiful project bags. I um, bought yarn from you that year. You bought Was it that one? I was gonna say it was one of the Star Trek Star Wars ones, but no, I remember the one you bought. You put that in a shawl recently, didn't you? In a dotted race, yeah with my other really yarn yeah. festival stuff from that year. Anyway, that's yeah. about, yeah. Less less about, about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> more about you. In terms of your crafting habits, you do a lot, you do a lot on the crafting front. But... Yes, a tad, what, yes. Yes, you do. So what craft came first then? Okay, so here's a short quarter for you guys. Uh, I actually started with jewellery making. Oh, okay. I, I did not start with knitting. Mm-hmm. I, well, rewind to like when I was a tiny, tiny person. My mum taught me knitting when I was growing up. And then as a kid, you tend to forget about that sort of stuff. And you, you're outdoors playing, you're with friends, you're, for my generation, you guys are too young. Um, it was the kind of the coming about of the internet and all that stuff, MSN, like eventually you kind of, stayed indoors a lot more than you went outside and then um it got to when I was in college mm-hmm. and like what is it six or eight weeks you get off for college and it's not long enough to get a job but you need something to keep you busy mm-hmm. so I was at I'm pretty sure it was like the hobby craft event that happens in the SECC and there was just all these really beautiful beads and I was just like oh I want to I want to do something with those but I don't know how to so I started attending like jewelry making classes and stuff Mm. and that's really what got me through for about two maybe two and a half three summers and then I tried picking up needles again and trying the whole knitting thing and I just wasn't getting it like just was not one working and so I discovered loom knitting instead do you know those like little the plastic things you get? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I started in one of those, and I was hooked. I was flying like you couldn't prize that away from me at all. But something just it felt too bulky. It wasn't exactly the most portable craft in the world. It's not not portable, but you're sitting with this big massive rectangle. And you're trying to like work on that instead of like two small needles. So it wasn't feasible for out and about. And then I still didn't take up knitting after that. Like having that realization, I was just like, yeah, I'm still not doing it. So I tried crochet instead. And I still to this day remember the first time I attempted crochet and I got so frustrated. I couldn't figure it out for the life of me and I put it down and I didn't touch it for six months god knows what I done during those six months but I remember then going back to it and be like right okay I'm gonna give it another try and I was flying like I literally just picked it up I don't know what happened I don't know what changed but I constantly had a crochet hook in my hand from then on but I think most crocheters might agree with this I don't know but I started feeling that there wasn't that much choice when it comes to like um crochet patterns and designs and stitches in general a lot of them were the pineapple stitch 
Mm-hmm. And you can only do so many things with the pineapple motif. <laughs> <laughs> Where you're kind of like, okay, I am so sick of pineapples. <laughs> So we got to like that point and I was just like, okay, I'm going to try knitting again. So this would have been, what? Mm. I, was, I would have been about 20 that I kind of came to this realisation. And I'm 30 now, so 10 years ago, I kind of realised that knitting was going to be a, like tried again, if that makes sense. I was going to try it. And I haven't looked back. And then everything else just kind of fell in after that. So I was attending um, what was my local knit night. Uh, sadly, it's no more. And they were, they all had spinning wheels and they were talking about weaving. And I was just like, I was like a kid in a candy shop. I was just like, what are these things? Oh my God, teach me everything. And that's how that all started. So I started spinning on a drop spindle. And then I got my first wheel which then progressed into my second wheel and my third wheel and now my last and fourth wheel. And then sewing because I wanted to make my own things and fabric is too gorgeous not to buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really my story. Um, Just it started to get me through summer in college and then... I never really stopped making things after that. I've always been quite a creative person since, like, I was a kid. And I don't know, there's something really nice and satisfying about making things. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. knowing that you've done it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. So it took a couple of years, but knitting became my primary craft. Yeah. <laughs> so... Obviously, talking about the different things that you've done, um, you have a shop. You sell some of the beautiful things that you do. Mm-hmm. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you make and what you sell? Sure. Um, for a while, it was mostly project bags that I was doing. And that's because I had shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. and um, dyeing yarn was way too painful for me so I'd kind of given that up so it's mostly project bags and um, I've got a couple of different designs that I work with and I'm constantly trying to find new designs that are different and interesting and also um, to kind of fit every type of project so like a small one for socks a big one for jumpers mm. um kind of in between size for not a small show but not a large show yeah um, so i i like to think like my my project bags are a wee bit different because most of the time i will choose like geekier fabrics like mario and doctor who and all that kind of jazz because that is that's me yeah yeah and, um, I'm maybe not as geeky as some people. Like, I wouldn't say I was as geeky as yourself, Sia, but I'm definitely kind of like in that world where I like the geekier things and I have a respect for floral fabrics, mm-hmm. but I will not buy them. <laughs> uh, to me, I would rather go for like the more fun fabrics and geekier things and quirky is more my style yeah so it's like the same with my designs they're not quite your bog standard bag design Mm. so I like to think I'm a wee bit different in that aspect yeah and then like my yarn like I don't even know how to describe that it's it's more kind of like whatever takes my fancy on the day like I never go in with a plan Mm-hmm. I never go in and say right I'm going to only use these colours I I literally take all my dye out and put it on my countertop and then just be like oh that one looks cool and yeah I'll pick up that one Um, so I don't I'm not your average dyer in the sense that a lot of people that I'm not saying every dyer but a lot of dyers have a very good understanding of colour theory mm. Yeah, I don't have that. <laughs> I, I have no colour theory. I 
I may have done art in high school and gone on to do photography and stuff in college, but I don't get color theory. I don't understand it. I don't particularly have the time to learn either, which some people might be unhappy to hear, but I have a very busy life and it's either spend time learning something or spend time doing something. Mm -hmm. So I do instead of learn. I, I make mistakes along the way. Like you figure out some colors really don't go together and that's fine. But I like to go in and just play with color and see what comes out at the end of the day. And it makes it a wee bit more interesting as well. Yeah. So are there any bases and things that you like working with or fibers that you prefer dyeing to others? I'm still learning um with some different bases because i've only really just kind of got back into it so it's also kind of like um digging up the memories of what i had done beforehand because it's been over i'd say about a year since i was dying properly and so it's it's been a very extreme learning curve getting back into it and i'm learning the bases i don't like using mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so at the moment, and uh, this might upset some people, but at the moment I'm not enjoying non-superwash yarns because I'm still learning that they take colour a lot differently than the superwash yarns. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the moment my favourite base is just um, your bog standard 7525 superwash merino and nylon. Mm -hmm. um, because I love how it takes colour like you can get really really saturated like I have one that is literally neon highlighter slap bang between yellow and green Ooh. Ooh. I don't know how to describe the colour but it took it so well and I was just like wow whereas I tried something similar on a non superwash and yet yeah, did not turn out anywhere near what mm -hmm. the first one had but I'm still experimenting with some bases. Uh, I have one that is 100% uh, Corridale. Ooh. Uh, non superwash. Mm. So um, I'm really interested to see how that works. Mm -hmm. And I also have one that's um, a Merino Massam mix. Oh. And it's a really beautiful grey. And I, I'm going to be keeping some as undyed because the colour, the, the natural colour is just stunning. But because it's got that grey already, I'm really curious to see how the colour takes to it. So that's, that's going to be in the dye pot soon, hopefully. But I'm not sure. Like, I, can't, I feel like I need to go in with that one with a wee bit more of a plan mm -hmm. because I don't have much of it just now I can always order more but what I have just now I don't want to just go in and ruin because I don't know how it's going to take color so I feel like I have to go in just a wee bit more prepared with that one yeah so we've mentioned you know with your um yarn it's more kind of a creative process and you mentioned there that it's kind of geeky things that inspire you for your bags um now you have a really cool bag design mm -hmm. that you came up with yourself I think didn't didn't you it's like it's like I think and where you can unzip it and then it folds out into almost like a a yarn ball type yeah um, How did you come up with that? a lot of my inspiration comes from Pinterest mm -hmm. okay um, and I follow a few like specific I don't know if they call them tags on Pinterest or not but um, so I follow like knitting, knitting project bags, sewing bags, handmade bags, that kind of thing. Like, and every single one of them I've seen, like I know a lot of bags come out with the box bottom, as they call it, but they were all the same, the same design or roughly the same elements to the bag. And um, so a lot of them with the box bottom that allowed it to sit upright were all drawstring bags mm -hmm. and I had a severe surplus of zips <laughs> like I had way too many zips I needed to find something that I could insert a zip into um, 
for like a specific size. So the zips I use are 14 inches. And I'm not really sure how I came up with that design in particular. I think it was just kind of a series of um, failed attempts, basically. Because uh, I keep all the bags that don't work. I keep all of them because essentially they still work, but they're not quite what I wanted the finished result to be. Mm-hmm. And I'd never seen a design like that before when it kind of came to the end result. And I was really, really pleased with it. But at the same point, I was quite scared to release it because it's so different. Mm. You know what I mean? You're not really sure how people are going to take it because they want the status quo, they want the drawstring bag or they want the straight up and down, box bottom, zippy bag. Mm-hmm. They Nobody has really kind of pushed the boundaries when it comes to project bags. Mm-hmm. And so I think it took me a long time to come up with that design because part of me was too scared to go with the ideas I was coming up with and like the inspiration that I was getting so I tend to see something I like and I take a screenshot of it and then I'll sit back and I'll go through all my screenshots and I'll be like oh but what if you put that that part of that bag with this part of that bag and 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 then you could do like a zip instead of the drawstring and like um I like that I call the part of the bag that folds out so that it sits after you've completely undone the zip the zip the gusset Mm -hmm. the gusset of that bag because I've been knitting so many socks I got the idea of the gusset from the gusset of a sock like the heel flap of the sock oh cool so it was it wasn't even like always a bag that inspired me it was like my knitting as well that was inspiring me and it just it took some time but it was mostly just kind of taking parts of one bag design with a part of another bag design or um, not even a design, the construction. Taking one piece of a construction method and another piece of construction method and then chuck in a knitted sock (laughs) and all of a sudden I have a new bag design. I was just like, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. That's That's a really cool process that like it's lots of little things coming together and then being able to mash them all in your mind it's it can be quite difficult because until you have that on paper and then you have a finished design you never actually know what it's going to look like it's like imagine you have this this image in your head of the perfect outfit and then you try it on and it looks god awful yeah oh yeah that's kind of like the same process for the bag the bag designs i go through and you you genuinely think this is going to look amazing it's going to look amazing this it's going to be the best thing in the world and then you make it and you're like wow that so does not work (laughs) it took a few tweaks to get it right but when I did I was really really pleased with it and I don't know I'm my, my process might not make sense to others because it's very haphazard and jumpy and going from x to z to a again but it gets there it works (laughs) so do you have any kind of future plans or anything that you'd like tell us about or any things we should look out for coming from you in the future Ooh, interesting (laughs) now how much do i tell (laughs) (laughs) that is the age-old question as much as you like we can edit it out later Uh, myself and Aileen of the Little Bush Baby Makes, uh, we are having a collaboration for Perth where she is feeding a specific design. I'm not saying any more than that. And I am putting that with a select run of bags. Ooh. And there's only going to be a select number. And that once they're gone, that they're gone. Like, um, the reason we're doing a select number is just because of the amount of time it takes for Aileen to make the beads, uh, make the stitch markers. And it wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be fair of me to then go like, oh, hey, see, can you do me another 20 or something? Mm-hmm. So we're doing it as a set number. 
and basically she's going to provide a specific design that will go with a specific run of bags that are going to be in different colours but all with the same theme. Mm. There'll be, there will be teasers in the run up so if anyone would like to follow me on Instagram and Facebook they will see the teasers there but we will be running limited numbers on a first come first serve basis and I can't promise that I will be left with any to put up on Etsy so it's to kind of build the tension <laughs> build the system yep. uh, but <laughs> um, in general um, I'm just working on some new designs I currently it might not sound like much but I haven't really offered until now uh, a sweater quantity size bag mm-hmm. and so I'm working on that just now and um, every day at the dipot is an interesting day because I can never tell anybody what's coming out of it <laughs> I don't even know what's coming out of it so like for example, there uh, on Friday I took to the dye pots after work, and I only dyed ten. That was that was kind of like um, what I wanted. I only wanted to do ten, and I was hoping once I looked at the colours, I was like, right, okay, I'm going to pick that, and then I mixed it. So I picked um, I don't know if it was like Aztec gold or orange or something, but then I picked up another one that was um silver grey. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, let's see how those two mix. And when I mixed them in my jug, I was like, oh, I've made a terrible, terrible decision. And I was like, right, I'm not wasting the dye. So I put it in the pot and I put the I put the yarn in, and it it didn't take how I wanted it to. So I need to work on that application a wee bit more. But it came out with this really gorgeous kind of like gold, like mustardy yellow. Ooh. Um. So even though at first I was kind of like, oh, I've made a really horrible mistake by putting these two colours together it turned out really good I just need to work on the application process a wee bit more because mm-hmm. uh, I'm I'm obsessed with mustard yellow at the moment, completely obsessed but I can openly talk about future bag designs I'm working on but I can't talk about yarn because I never know what's going to happen but that's exciting yeah, you know. yeah I think so Means people got to keep an eye on your yeah. shop at all times. You know? <laughs> yeah, follow you on Instagram. <laughs> Buy it when it's there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I know I was talking to yourself, Pip, about this. That I was kind of worried about um, how people were going to take my yarn because, and some people might not agree with this, but this is my form. Like uh, I, I was diagnosed with dyslexia back when I was in high school, so well over twenty years ago. Um, and I have difficulty understanding very weird things. So one of them is anything to do with banks. And I used to work for a bank. <laughs> but the other one is I cannot figure out how to recreate colorways. And I was really, really worried about this because people like rebuying things if they like it so much like um i know a lot of people love specific colorways from specific makers like the first one off the top of my head my top of my head is eldritch mm. from russell Garrett. Mm-hmm. like everyone loves that color and um i wouldn't if that was my colorway i wouldn't be able to recreate it after like the first time because i can't figure out how to do it so people have always said oh just write down like how much dye you use and in what order I've tried that it doesn't work and then other people have said photograph it at different stages tried that and it doesn't work and then I've even tried like filming the entire process just to try and recreate the color and it doesn't work um so there's just something in my my brain that's kind of blocking that process and so I was kind of talking to some of my friends about it and Pip just happened to be one of them. And I said like how I was actually quite worried about that because it would mean like most of my dyes, like most of my dye jarring would be kind of like more one of a kinds. Mm. And trying to build up a customer base with only one of a kinds could be really quite difficult. And um, 
it makes you worry that your stuff isn't going to be good enough. But I just like dyeing yarn because I never know what's going to come out. It's quite a, I do find it quite a relaxing process because I don't go in with a cert plan. I don't go in with any pressure. Mm -hmm. I just go in, I have fun with colour and then I see what comes out of it at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. If it all goes terribly wrong, I have black dye for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to need a black skein of yarn at some point. So for me, it is more of a, a fun process. And to, to some people, and I have had this criticism in the past, that it shouldn't be just a fun process. You should be going in with a plan. You should be going in with an idea because at the end of the day, it is your business. But if I was to try and go in with a plan and set guidelines and stuff, then I would probably have given up mm. yarn dyeing a long, long time ago, well before any of my issues with my shoulder. Mm. So it's, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, also, stuff those people. Yeah, I've never been one to conform to rules and people. So I think it was just because obviously when you're a startup business, when somebody gives you kind of like negative feedback like that, sometimes it can squirm away into your head and you can reflect on it and be like, oh, well, maybe they're right. Maybe they're not going to like it and stuff. But like even my bags are quite unique because I only buy... For the most part, when I buy fabric, I only buy fat quarters. So a lot of my bags are only one of a kind. Mm -hmm. And people have never had an issue with that before. But I feel because yarn dyeing is now such a huge business because people are turning their backs, for the most part, on acrylic. They're, they're, they are coming more around to indie dyers that as the business grows, there's more fear that your stuff's just not going to be good enough. But so far I haven't given up and people are giving f good feedback on what they're seeing. So fingers crossed. <laughs> You're doing something right because yeah. your yarn is beautiful. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Do you want to mention your celebrity um, Instagram comment? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, you guys, you would not believe how happy I was when I seen that comment. I just happened to be scrolling through it, my Instagram because I tried to put my phone down in the evening just now so that I can spend a wee bit more time on my crafting or my sewing or the dyeing, whatever. And I just happened to look on Instagram and I seen that I'd had a comment from Countess Blaze saying that she really liked one of the colours on my drying rack. And I was just like, holy cow, like, what the heck? And I instantly sent it to some of the, like, one of the group chats I'm in, and I was just like, oh my god, look! And everyone's just like, that's amazing, and they were so happy for me, and I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I just, I was, I think I was in shock mm -hmm. <laughs> that one of my yarn dyeing idols had actually commented saying that she really liked one of the yarns. And oh, annoyingly, it was one of the ones where I'd only dyed two. <laughs> Normally, like, my minimum is five. Mm -hmm. And I'd only got two because it was to use up dye that was in the pots. Um, so I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was so blown away. And it just... When you have those kind of, like, negative feelings because other people have put them in your head, when you get a comment like that, it just pushes you for the sky it just literally pushes you for the sky and I was so happy and I couldn't believe it I couldn't wait to get back to the dye pots and I was just like what other things can I make <laughs> and oh it just came at the right time because like you know that way sometimes you just have a wee bit of like your day's just a wee bit too demanding and like you've just had one too many like wee hiccups in the road and then all of a sudden the countess has left a comment on your Instagram and you're just like, okay, day is amazing. Anything could happen now because the countess has commented on my picture. My life is good. Yeah. <laughs> it might sound like a pure massive overreaction, but it just reminds you that 
you're doing something you love and that other people like it. Yeah. Especially her, because you're like, she is a dying goddess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You are, of course, another podcaster. It is, in fact, how we met, I guess, yeah. through the podcast lounge at Perth. Yep. So how did your podcast come about? Well, that's a whole different story entirely. Um, I started doing a podcast over three years ago. And the only reason I know that is because I started it well before Scott and I became a couple. And we've been a couple over three years now. Um, and when I started that podcast, I was still coming to terms with my health issues. So I'm very open in the fact that I am suffering from Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and a few other chronic illnesses. And when you have chronic illnesses that affect your day to day life and the ability to go out of your house, you, you, you lose touch with people, you lose a sense of belonging in a community. And it was getting to the point where my knitting group had basically closed because we used to go to a, a yarn shop and the yarn shop sadly closed. So our knitting group kind of fell away. And then it was... Um, during a period where I actually had to move back home and I just felt very secluded. I felt very lost and I was feeling very bored in my job and I started googling. Like I had no idea podcasts existed. No idea whatsoever. But you hear of all these other things like you hear of Twitch for gamers and um, lifestyle podcasts and stuff like that. So I was just, I just randomly went on youtube one day and i started like checking for knitting podcasts and lo and behold there was knitting podcasts i was like oh my god this is amazing this is like the best thing in the world and give it like six six or eight months or something and i finally decided right i'm gonna do this because i feel like this could be how i start feeling like i be i belong to a community because if you can't get out and you don't really have a knitting community of your own why not make one mm -hmm. so it took a lot like it took me my first podcast i originally recorded at like 11 o'clock in the morning and i re-recorded it and i re-recorded it and i re-recorded it and i finally my last recording and you can watch the first episode is when the sun is going down <laughs> took me from 11 o'clock in the morning until god knows when to finally get through the anxieties and the panic and the nervousness of recording that first episode and i just kind of bit the bullet and i was just like right we'll just put it up we'll see how people take it if they don't like it they don't like it if they like it amazing and there's been a few times where I've taken a bit of a hiatus because life in general and but I haven't regretted starting that podcast. I regret how long it took me to put the first one out because the <laughs> is terrible but I'm pretty pleased with it overall and it's been really interesting because like I like I said I didn't have a community before because I was just too sick at that point but through it I've met yourselves and i've met a whole bunch of other people that i i'm really like honored to call my friends and my close friends and if i hadn't been for starting that podcast i don't think i would be at all where i am today in terms of the friends i have the dyeing and the sewing i don't think i would have started that without the podcast behind me and I don't know, like, it's very weird to think about and vocalise it, but I think it was one of the best things I ever done was just biting that bullet and going for it. Mm -hmm. And I do recommend, like, I know there's, I know everyone says that the podcasting community for knitting and crochet is very saturated, but I would recommend it if anyone is thinking of starting one, just go for it because at the end of the day, you've got nothing to lose. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just takes, I say it just takes, like, you've then got the editing and the rewatching and then the posting. So it takes about a day all in to kind of get everything done. But at the end of the day, think of what you can gain, not what you can lose, because at the end of the day, you've only lost your time mm -hmm. for that one. But you can gain so much from just putting that first episode out. Yeah. Hard agree. <laughs> we are glad you made it through that first episode. Yes. I just, I, I generally laugh looking back at it or thinking back at it at how long it took me to actually be happy with like the episode. I don't have any of the, the ones that I scrapped. Like, I, I, I lost, I didn't lose them. I deleted them because the memory on my laptop is terrible. Mm. But like I generally started that about 11, 12 o'clock and I'm pretty sure the last recording, it was in winter, so it would have been about five, mm -hmm. five o'clock. I, I finally was happy with the recording and I'm just like, oh my God, I really have just lost an entire day. <laughs> and that was before I even learned like how to edit things and stuff and how to like um, squash down the file size and I was just like, wow. Those were the days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, the age-old question on pretty much every single knitting podcast slash vlog everything yeah. is, mm -hmm. what have you got on your needles? Ooh, well, I was going to keep one a wee bit quiet, but you don't have I to, guess you don't have to tell us all of them. No, it's it's nothing too secret, but do you know that way sometimes you want to go onto your own podcast and be like, hey, I've never spoke about this, but I have a finished object. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you guys can see this if I show this, but yeah, um, I actually started the V-neck magpie. Ooh. Hello. And I've, I started this last night mm. and I already have the two shoulder bits done and the first half of the back. Wow. Um, so I'm really, really flying through it, and I don't know. There's just, uh, as you know, you you're running the Ama sweater cow, and Pip totally enabled me <laughs> my own, uh, which I am wearing just now, and I wore it out for the first time on Saturday, mm -hmm. and I loved it. I absolutely really, really loved it. I didn't think I was going to love it as much as I did because it's cropped and body image and all that jazz um my own body image before anyone says anything um and there was just something really enjoyable about having it as a layering piece over a dress and the down point was I wore it the day I went to the zoo ah. and the weather in Edinburgh that day was not terrible it was about 15 degrees it was breezy and I thought, all right, this would be perfect. But hiking up that damn hill, wow. <laughs> I got to the top and I was just like stripping off basically. I was just like, nope, I can't have a wool jumper on right now. And so it's just kind of made me go, I want something that I can have on, but maybe not as like heavyweight <laughs> yeah. as the DKBFL. So I have cast on the V-neck magpie. And I have about three socks on the go at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, a shawl. I have the change of shawl by Mina Phillip, which is for the neck blanket mal that myself and Marcus of Fiberpunk is running. Lovely. And totally, totally putting that up on your podcast. Yes. <laughs> Self promotion. <laughs> Feel free. I mean, I'm knitting a project for that, so. And I need to cast on a project for that. <laughs> Hey, you've got to September, it's all good. Yeah, that is a good point. When does it? When does the um, mal end? First of September is the official start date. And for anyone that is attending, we are hoping to get a group photo whilst everyone is at Perth. Excellent. So if people want to stop by myself or Marcus's stall, we can try and... We'll probably get like a specific time arranged for one of the days. So that, you know, not every, like I'm not saying people can't come up to us and be like, hey, can we get a selfie? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. But 
I think there's like going to be an amazing impact if we were to try and get as many people in that picture as possible. Yeah. Uh, I keep flitting between all my projects at the moment and I get up, um, not early for work, but I get up so that I have enough time to kind of get a cup of tea and unwind, unwind with my knitting. And I'll get up in the morning sometimes, I'll be like, right, okay, I want to work on the most complex knitting thing I have on my needles. And then other mornings I'll be like, brain, not working, plain sock. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I have to have like a bit of everything on my needles, but not too much because I get a wee bit overwhelmed by having things sitting on my needles for too long. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like my Sunset Highway, which still isn't finished. (laughs) (laughs) Eventually, you get there. Like, see, has managed to like get a whole one out in the time that it's taken me to get one half knitted. <laughs> You'll love it once it's done. Mm-hmm. I love it as it is. I just I hated the fact I'd maybe I I kind of sacrifice my knitting for some cookies. Mm. So I don't regret it. I'd eat those cookies all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about loving yeah. it when it's done, do you have a favorite fo? Ooh, hard question. Mm -hmm. That's a very hard question. Can I have three? (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) Only because it's you, Chris. Uh, Pardon? Only because it's you. (laughs) Uh, Well, my Ama sweater is now my firm favourite. Yes. But I also have two shawls that I absolutely adore. And one of them isn't even a pattern. It's one I just kind of made up as I went along and it's the one I made with my Mothy and the Squid Minis and the Rainbows Mm -hmm. like I wear it all the time and I just love it so much because it's so big and you can just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it and uh, my other one is my Exploration Station yes we knit it as the cow Mm -hmm. myself myself, you two and Rosie we made it as the cow Mm -hmm. and it was so I don't I don't know how to explain it. I tend to hate shawls that have a ridiculous number of stitches. Like anything over two hundred, I'm probably not going to do. <laughs> and the exploration station gets up to what four hundred stitches? Yeah, if not mm-hmm. more. Yeah. Yeah, if not more. And I'm already like I say already. After I cast it off, I was like, yeah, I kinda wanna make another one, but on a bigger needle and um, I'm still thinking of doing that even though it kind of goes above my 200 stitch limit and I it just I don't wear it as much because I work from home now so I'm not out as much but it sits on my mannequin in my office and every so often I kind of turn around and I look at it and I'm like I do love that shawl (laughs) so I have three that's that's basically the way I, I look at it. I couldn't think I don't think I could pick anything else yeah. or limit or narrow it down to one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so where will people next be able to see you and all of your various amazing project ba- bags and yarns first and foremost? So in person mm-hmm. they will be able to find me at Perth Festival of Yarn on the seventh and eighth of September at the Jewish Centre in Perth, Scotland. Mm -hmm. And um, online, I'm hoping to have an update in the next couple of weeks, if not next month. And that will be on my Etsy shop. Uh, So if you just search for Grenaic Creations on Etsy, it will come up. And I can give the link to yourselves, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense to you. So I'm hoping to have a wee update, but I'm also hoping to maybe open um, my own website. Ooh. Because Etsy fees are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I will keep everyone up posted, um, keep everyone updated through my Instagram and my Facebook page, but I still need to kind of work out the logistics of the whole website thing. So in person, Perth, Mm -hmm. online, uh, it's either going to be through my Etsy shop or my website. Fantastic. So thank you very much for this interview. It's been really good fun. Yep. Thank you. And yeah, code, 
everyone listening, go and check her yes. out online. <laughs> also, we win. We got you onto the audio. Yeah. Audio. Woo. <laughs> right? Bye, everyone.